And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, the head man behind Lion Wing Publishing, Previously been on here for things like Picaresque Roman, Fledge Witch, and Convictor Drive. And now making his triumphant return with Eldrick Escape Tokyo, which managed to get completely funded in about four hours. Congratulations on that. The one and only Bradley Hailstrom. How you doing today, man? Nildra, I'm doing well, sir. Thanks for having me back. This is round four for us. Um, I appreciate every time you brought me on and uh, definitely appreciate you bringing me on today to talk about Eldritch Escape. Ah, four. The golfer's favorite number. That's what they say. <laughs> that's, what it, that's, what they, that's what they keep telling me and then, then I end up getting hit. You gotta learn quicker. Yeah, but I, but I usually give the receipt. Um, and no, before you ask, no, I haven't tried to do the whole golf course air horn thing like in jackass although i have thought about it i've done that i've done that with people playing pool <laughs> that's so rude <laughs> <laughs> yeah but when when your opponent is to is talking metric tons of shit about how much better at, at a at pool he is than you i think it's called for ah fair game fair <laughs> game yes indeed mm -hmm. i mean if if i'm not if I, if I can't if i can't beat him clean i'll beat him dirty that's right the best way to beat him. Yeah. But now with now Eldrick Escape Tokyo as we as we had talked about before we um hit before we hit record. This is a this is an interesting beast because the because the approach that you've had with this one is a little bit different than the last three times I've brought you in. So I think I think we should go into that part. Yeah, let's. Uh, this this was a, definitely a different type of project with a different um, set of tasks, a uh, different timeline, a completely different approach. Um, so in the past, we've always localized uh, books that had been out for a while. Certainly books that had already been published. If they hadn't been out a while, they'd already been out for a little bit. Uh, and so that process, that development process and localization process is very different than when you are when you are with a project at the start of development through the completion of it. And so with Picaresque, Convictor, and Fledgewitch, you know, we were going in and we were we were translating and editing work that was already done. The game was finished. It had been for a while. It had been out in Japanese retailers for, for quite a bit. And our responsibility was pretty narrow, right? Like we're just translating the thing. Um, and certainly in all of those projects, we have gone to the to the authors and said, hey, we'd like to add more to this book. Can A, can we do that? And B, are you up for the task? Because you're probably the right person to do that yourself and we will pay you for it. Or if you're not, say, the illustrator, can you get in contact with the original illustrator and can we commission them to produce more art? So it is a very narrow, narrow uh, development process. This, however, with this project, quite a bit different. So what a lot of people don't know, at least in the West, is that this game was originally featured in a um, a Japanese TTRPG Digest magazine. So there was something like of a game. Yeah, so there was like there was a game jam essentially, and the designer uh, of of this particular game, who is well known in Japan primarily for Stellar Knights, uh, which is a massive massive TTRPG in Japan, was asked to develop a game and and just like. I don't know, like 15 pages or something like that. And so uh, Fuyu-san, uh, Fuyu Takizato is the, the core designer. And he's got some other developers that helped him, but he is the principal designer. And so, um, yeah, he put together a game in 15 pages with uh, a very minimalistic kind of backdrop and setting. And the bulk of the game, the bulk of that 15 pages were just combat rules. Because this thing had to be short, uh, Fuyu-san decided that, you know what, I should just focus on the combat of this game because I don't have a lot of real estate to work with here, and I think it probably makes sense that this be more of an encounter-based, uh, almost like combat-exclusive RPG, right? Mm -hmm. So they released it in this digest, and people liked it, and that was the end of it. So <clears throat> fast forward quite a bit of time, because uh, this 
game was featured in that digest a, a while ago, uh, more than 18 months ago, maybe two years ago or something like that. So I had reached out to Draconian, which is Fuyasan's design studio. And I actually reached out to them because I, I wanted to localize one of their other books. And Fuyasan's representative um, contacted me and said like, hey, um, Fuyasan wouldn't really be comfortable uh, releasing that book as his first book to the global audience because um, he wants to tweak some things. And if he, if he ever revisited, he, he would want to add to it. And so he doesn't want to do that. But uh, he is looking to design a game either from the ground up or to build off another system that he's got. Would you be interested in hearing what that might look like? And so from there, we just had conversation after conversation, ultimately decided that his digest game was the one that we were going to take and turn into a full-fledged you know, RPG. And with that, since he was taking a 15 page book and, you know, extrapolating that out into something much, much larger, I said, okay, so if you do this, I will pay for it. I'll pay for the translation. I'll split the, the art cost with you, or I can pay it all myself. And they wanted to split the art costs and that's fine. Um, and then, you know, we'll translate it, we'll edit it, and we'll do a simul release uh, because that's never been done before. I think that'd be cool. A lot of the stuff that Lion Wing is predicated on is like first. You know, um, I like to be the first of, of things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm an avid reader of manga, avid watcher of anime. You know, simul releases are, that's that's just like the norm in those two mediums. And I said, well, hell, no one else is doing Japanese TTRBGs like Lion Wing is. I've got this unique opportunity to be at the forefront of the simul release thing for a brand new genre. Let's make this the first one. And so that's kind of how Eldritch Escape came along. Um, it was it was interesting because not only did we pay for for a lot of the development, um, but we got some say in how the game was developed. Which I didn't want too much say in it because you know I'm I run a company and our past RPGs I've been an editor on, so I, I know my way around words. Um, but game design is not necessarily my thing, and so when they asked if I wanted to be a part of that, I said, "Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll make it very limited, though." Um, so kind of like bring ideas to me and kick them around and say like, hey, what do you like or would you like, would you like to add to this? And that's kind of how we did that. Though the bulk of the game was definitely in Draconian and Fuyasan's. Uh, that was in their department. That's primarily what they did. And here we are, you know, um, I don't know, a year later or so since we signed the contract. And we're on Kickstarter right now. As you said, we had our, our funding go uh, a little over four hours. We've unlocked four stretch goals and I, I'm getting ready to uh, reveal the f the fifth one tonight. So it, you know what? It's it's working well for us. Yeah. <clears throat> now, I do I do remember when oh the when the announcements came around for Eldrick es Eldrick Escape and people were were um sit were saying were saying Dark Souls meets Attack on Titan. Um. Now in the end, I can certainly see I can certainly see that to a point but i but when i saw when i saw that i remember what ended up happening with convictor drive where i where i and i'd, I'd say a good amount of others uh, made the assumption of it being the common writer rpg which of course convictor drive certainly is but the enlightening thing out of that was more of the iron man inspiration that you mentioned so with eldrick escape um, I'm curious if if um you if you were made aware of what were some of the major inspirations that led to that led to its creation, it, or if yeah. that was, if that was something that was discussed. It it totally was. Uh, so that was the first thing. Once we well, not the first thing, um, but that was one of the early on discussions when we were discussing. Uh, you know, when I was saying like, okay, tell me more about this digest RPG that you think would be worthwhile to develop mm -hmm. um, into something larger. And in that discussion, I'm as, as the guy who runs the company, I'm always thinking about marketing. Um, uh, Cause if, if you don't know how to market your game, your, your game's not going to do well. Right. So like, oh, yeah. that's always one of, if not the top priority for me. And so a conversation that I always have with folks at the beginning of, of the development and I've done this with Convictor and Fledge and Picaresque and all the ones that we got coming out is, all right, tell me what inspired you. Cause I need to like, I need a reference point here. 
um, because I can d probably derive some stuff on my own, but I want to hear from your mouth for sure what made you create this world. What was uh, what were the outside works that really influenced your creation of 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 this one? In this case, Eldritch Escape. And so there were a couple that that Fuyasan immediately said. So Dark Souls was number one. Bloodborne was number two. Uh, Gantz, Blood Plus, mm -hmm. and then Attack on Titan. And so. If you're if you're around the, the the Japanese gaming or anime scene, like all of those things sound familiar. Oh yeah, you're at least you know familiar with those names, but more than likely you have engaged with all of those properties to some extent. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, yes, I right? have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for me, it's once I hear that when I'm doing marketing, I can't just throw out like, oh, what's well, influenced by this and this and this and this and this, you know, people stop listening after a while. So for me, I always try to grab two works. Mm -hmm. I've done this for every book. It's like, all right, what are the, what are the two things in here that people are going to recognize the most? And so that was an easy one when he gave me a list of those, uh, of those properties. Dark Souls obviously was always going to be the thing that I mentioned first because it was his primary inspiration. Mm -hmm. So Fuyasan is a diehard from software guy. Um, and so he had been kind of itching to uh, author his, his his own Dark Souls. And so Eldritch Escape was his opportunity to do that, especially this expanded version. Um, so it was easy for me to immediately grab on grab on to Dark Souls. But the problem with grabbing on to Dark Souls is like, I, 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 like 12 years now, everything's Dark Souls, right? Like <laughs> there, there's like a, a quote, Dark Souls inspired game or whatever coming out. It, it, it feels like every Tuesday. It's, so it's what's helped Iron Pineapple have a career on YouTube. <laughs> Cause yeah, that, right. Cause that's mostly I mean, what he does. Just grab ra random souls likes that he finds on Steam. It's, it's a huge thing. And so it makes sense to gravitate toward that. However, there's also a lot of it. And because that word, Dark Souls, or Dark, Dark Souls-esque, or Soulsborn, has been used so much that it's almost diluted to this point, I needed to pair it with something else. And so that's when I grabbed Attack on Titan from those list of works. Like, for me, personally, Gantz is like, that's, you know, that was one of Fuyasan's inspiration. It's like, well, I love Gantz. I want to market it as Gantz. And then, you know, I'm like, uh, only a bunch of, like, old people know Gantz, <laughs> like old people like me. So like, I'm not going to lean into that attack on Titan though, is, is cross generational uh, because of how long it's been out there and the timeline that it's hit for and having the longest final season of all. Oh time. my Lord, dude. What it's, only, it's, only, it's only now that the fight that we've got the final ending to the final season. Finally, <laughs> like dude, the, it's... the final season started like what a year and a half ago. <laughs> right? It's like end chapter of the end chapter of the end chapter of the end chapter. Um, so uh, so it made sense to, to pair Attack on Titan with Dark Souls. And that's really where I went with it. And I knew any time that I throw out a, an influence or an inspiration or I lean into one, there's always going to be, be people that say, well, not exactly. You know, like, like Convictor Drive. We certainly did not shy away from the tokusatsu-inspired stuff. Yeah. We mentioned it on the, on the campaign pages and all our press releases. And at the same time, what's more recognizable to most folks, Kamen Rider or tokusatsu? Uh, so, you know, Kamen Rider was was the more approachable term, yeah. even if tokusatsu was maybe the, a little bit more accurate. The same thing with 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 Eldritch Escape. Um, and I'm not sh I'm not sure if you saw the Valley of the Judge season that Zan and I did on Convictor Drive, but um, I had frequently made reference to um, not just to Kamen Rider in, in general, but specifically Kamen Rider Fies, which is mm -hmm. apropos mm -hmm. because that's now getting a um, anniversary movie called Paradise Regained. Um, I think I think it should be out in the in V Cinema Theaters in Japan in Japan by now, if not later this year. Oh. You know, I'm gonna be honest with you. I um I want to reach out to Toei and see if we could get the license uh for Common Rider because I think we could we could fit Common Rider into the Convictor Drive system well, like pretty easily. I think um, so, um I think some seasons would be easier than others. Yes, um, absolutely. The, the you'd have to be intentional. Mm -hmm. The specific when you're dealing with the tech-based entries, like say, like say, Fies or Z or Zero One, or even to an extent X Aid, and um, build this build to a point, I think it, I think it can work. When you start, when it comes to dealing with the more supernatural and the and the magical ones, like say Wizard 
or or blade or or ghost i think that i'm not going to say it's impossible but it is going to be at a higher floor <laughs> of ease yeah absolutely we'd, we'd have to be very intentional with with which series we chose to go with um because so i've, the I've seen the a lot of people try and do a um, a com a common rider or a or a Power Rangers RPG, and I always and um, the ones that end up falling a bit flat, you know, like the official Power Rangers RPG, which drove me to rage, <laughs> um, is the is the ones that try that try and encompass the encompass the totality of the franchise when that franchise has gone all over the place uh, over over the years. I mean. We, Look at look at look at all the different um, themes and gi and gimmicks that say Super Sentai has had ever since the seventies. We've got we've gone into martial arts. We've got we've gone into high tech. We've gone into animals. We've gone into nature. We've gone into the future. We've gone into space cops. You know, and you have to try and coalesce all of that it all of that into a book in in some form without it becoming just a borderline um, supers RPG like Champions. It's not. It's not an easy thing, and it's better to refine it into one particular direction and stick to that. Yeah, I think that's game development in general. Mm -hmm. Truthfully, is you know make <laughs> make your scope narrow. Uh, I feel like you know a lot. A lot of times things fail just because you're casting too wide a net. You want to do too much. You get too ambitious. The, uh, I remember talking with the designers of Cthulhu Tech, um, and specifically Matthew Grau, a few years ago. And he had mentioned that he that he out he outright admitted that with the original Cthulhu Tech they did a bit of a kitchen sink approach and that did and that um, didn't work. And for the reboot that they're doing, the Shadow War, they're focusing on a specific on specific areas um, first and foremost. Yeah, it's smart, right? Um, you know, because if you're not careful, you get into like this weird place of like feature and lore creep, and it's like how you. A book can only be so big. You can only have so many mechanics. Those mechanics if, can't cater yeah, to if, everything that's happened in the series ever. If, right? if I have to use another, ex if I have to use a more, a more popular example, consider the, um, the 40k RPGs that Fantasy Flight Games had put out. Uh, you know, yeah. he, they weren't trying to encompass the whole of the 40k galaxy, just different regions. Um, Dark Heresy, for instance, the focus was just on the Calixis sector. Um, Death Watch. The focus was on the Jericho Reach. You know that. You know it. That's still a large amount of space that you're that you're working with, but it's an it's an amount that you can build. You can reasonably build around without without having um, a developer version of analysis paralysis. Like I've talked. Yeah, about totally. <laughs> I've talked it's about how that can happen with players, but it can happen with designers as well. Oh, it totally can. It's it's like this. It's a super hard balance to find. Like how you got to give yourself enough runway, mm -hmm. but you can't give yourself too runway because then you'll never take off. So, <laughs> but you can't short yourself either. So, yeah, this is why I'm not a designer. This is why, like, I, I'm glad just to be the guy who runs the company and like jumps in, does some editing for this stuff uh, when when I'm needed because. I don't want to. I don't want to have to contend with these decisions because I, I already have too much analysis paralysis in my life. I don't. I don't need it in, in the design space either. Now, one of the other one of the, as you you mentioned earlier that the, that you like firsts and there's certainly quite a bit of it with Eldrick Escape because the I'd say the other first with this is unless I'm misreading it, this is very much a duet style of game. One player, one GM, quote unquote. It is so Fuyusan and a lot of Japanese. Uh, TTRPG authors like two-player games, and that's primarily because uh, that's what the audience wants. The audi uh, you know, the Japanese audience isn't necessarily the type to get together with six people around a table. That doesn't often happen. Um, so it's much easier to get people invested in TTRPGs in Japan if you only have to grab one other person with you, and so. Uh, Fuyusan, he's, he's, he's got like several two player only books. In, in fact, Revulture is one of the biggest and most popular, got several supplements. 
is a two-player game. And here we are again, you know, with Eldritch Escape, it's a two-player game. Now, it's this is a very different type of two-player games, a uh, two-player game, because, okay, you've got your player who plays the hunter. You've got your GM who is uh, facilitating combat. And I'll get more into why I chose the word facilitating combat instead of something else. Or, And then you've got the GM who's also playing what's called the bellwether, which is a GM controlled character who helps the player and is uh, an entity that actually helps the player figure out the weaknesses of the Eldritch they're trying to slay. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very engaging, um, very involved game for the GM because the GM is playing, is wearing multiple hats. That's, kind of what i like about it is it, i i played two player games that i don't know um i wasn't really into i thought they were boring there wasn't enough um dynamism to them this is not that though and so it tackles this two player genre in a pretty unique way in fact you know I, we don't really market it as such but in some ways this is not um like a GM versus player kind of game. It's more of a cooperative game because the enemies, the Eldritch themselves, these massive monsters, uh, are mostly automated. Their movements are automated. The GM is not having to make decisions about which move the Eldritch is going to make when it's the Eldritch's turn. That's already predetermined by um, a set of charts, uh, effectively, and by the battlefield itself. And um, uh, they're... Uh, it correlates to what are called trigger actions. And so the GM is just kind of facilitating combat that is running itself in many ways. Uh, and so in some ways, this is this is strictly like a, a, a cooperative game. Yet again, there were many things that I liked about this game when they gave me the, uh, you know, the, the elevator pitch or they showed me the digest mm -hmm. version. And I was like, hey, you know what? There's some really interesting ideas in this. Let's build on this. And and that that setup right there, that two player premise and how it handles the two player uh, approach is one of the things that drew me in. Mm -hmm. So, going for, going forward with going forward with that, oh, I did want I did want to touch a little bit on the oh, bellwether because and in in part because of something amusing I noticed with the design on the Kickstarter, um. Some of the some of the images that you used were the demonology um, sig sigils that are used in that particular practice, which I th I thought was an interesting little parallel with within this setup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, especially especially given how those those sigils are meant to trap particular spirits, essentially, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I can. Was that was that an intentional parallel you were trying to go with with the way the bellwether is described as this um cre this being of thought? So there are definitely things that we do by accident all the time, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's just that's everyone in this line of work. With our Kickstarter design, though, and with our book layout and our book design, everything you see is has has been chosen. Um, there's not a lot of like, oh, we happened upon that. Uh, and, unless we kind of have a, a, a general idea and we're just spitballing ideas and we happen upon an idea based on that spitballing session, sure, that happens. Uh, but no, the, those sigils were, were a, a design decision that we made for the Kickstarter, understanding how they might relate to the Eldritch and just the, the overall setting of the game and, uh, and, and what the bellwether uh, represents. Because the bellwether is... It, it, the, the bellwether's interesting. Um, because the bellwether plays a cooperative role in this game, they're helping the hunter figure out where the weaknesses are in the uh, Eldritch's defenses, and at the same time, the bellwether also has an ulterior motive that is not as altruistic as just wanting the hunter to succeed in killing this thing and not getting killed in return. And so the GM has to play this very precarious role as the bellwether of. I'm helping you, I'm helping you, and also I'm helping you for a reason, and it's not for you. Um, but yes, to get back to the, the 
page design on the campaign page itself. Yeah, that was, uh, that was, those were all the graphical elements you see on that page were discussed and implemented with intention. Mm -hmm. I I figured as much, but it's, Sometimes the line between what was intentional and what and what just was accidental genius is pretty thin. Oh, it's, it's pretty thin. That that's the wrong qualifier. It is super thin, because we, yeah, um, notwithstanding this, but we have we have stumbled upon some great stuff in the past that I wish we could claim you know true credit for, and it's like no, we just got there by accident. But hey, you know what? All that matters is that we got to the destination. Mm-hmm. Well. I remember Paula Schur saying the greatest innovations were done by people who had no idea what they were doing. You know, there's something to be said about that. Mm-hmm. I mean, posted posted notes are ubiquitous, and that was a complete accident. So you're so again in good company. But earlier you said that the GM facilitates combat. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd like to delve into that as far as why you use that particular wording. Yeah, sure. So, um, the GM is, yes, having to set up the antagonist for the player. This is, if you haven't checked out the page or if you haven't read through the lines yet, this is an uh, an encounter-based uh, uh, role-playing game. In some ways, it's almost like a a boss rush role playing game because you're not fighting like small fry enemies that you quickly dispatch. Every battle is against a massive eldritch, um, and the whole point of the game is you get killed a whole lot. Thus, the Soulsborn you know influence is there. In fact, it's it's critical as part of the lore, um, but also the mechanics that you die a lot because every time you die, you get stronger. Every time you die, you learn something knew about the Eldritch's tactics that you are then going to use the next time you have a go at them. And the next time you'll probably die again and you'll having you'll have learned something that time as well and you'll have grown stronger that time as well. Um, and so the the GM is facilitating that whole process because the the Eldritch's actions are effectively controlled as responses that are already predetermined as it relates to the hunter, the player, and where they are on the combat dial, the GM is really not making any choices about how that Eldritch is going to interact with uh, with the player at all. The player is deciding how the Eldritch is going to interact with them by the actions that the player takes. Uh, you know, so combat in this game is not done on on like a on a square grid. You're not moving around miniatures in, in a traditional combat sense. It's also not theater of the mind stuff. Um, this is done on on a combat wheel, and there are you know the combat wheel is spliced into uh, six different slots, each denoted with you know the numbers one through six. Mm-hmm. And depending where which numbered s- slot on that wheel you are is going to determine what actions you have available to you. And then based on the actions that you perform those from those available actions, also based on where you are, the Eldritch is going to respond to you. And so the GM is really just kind of facilitating the combat by uh, managing uh, the the, El- the Eldritch's data, mm-hmm. but they're not using the data to make decisions against the player. And so that's why I specifically choose that word, you know, facilitation of combat rather than anything else, because that's what it, that's, that's what it feels like that. Well, it doesn't feel like that. It is that. <laughs> um, and looking at the uh, looking at the example that was ge- that was given of the Spider King, um, mm-hmm. there's almost a there's almost a soft AI system in ter- in terms of the if else um, trigger action setup. So given th- given that, and get and given the fact that this is essentially a boss rush because well. The most interesting, the most interesting fights in a Souls like are always going to be the bosses. That's just that's just the nature of the beast. What I'm cur- what I'm curious about is if there's going in the full book, if there's going to be a little bit of a blurb on how one could modif- on how one could modify or, or put in su- or suggestions for um, trigger actions for GMs who want to c- do their own custom. Um, Eldrix. 
Yes, in fact, we have a whole chapter dedicated to it uh, because that is the point of this. You know, we can only include so many bosses in this mm. book. So it, it's really going to be up to the players, the GM, um, to design the Eldritch beyond what we're including in the book. And so Fuyusan really, really wanted to make it a point um, and underline that fact by just dedicating a chapter to it. Uh, so that chapter not only goes into how do you create or customize or modify current um, Eldritch data, but it teaches you how to set up the entire scenario. Because while the combat is a boss rush style combat, there's a whole lot of other moving parts that are not combat that make up the rest of this game. And so Fuyusan really wanted players to be able to get into this thing. And the magic of Eldritch Escape isn't necessarily what we're including in terms of, you know, enemy data and scenario data. We, we, we've included two scenarios in the book. One's, one's got roguelike elements to expand its replayability, you know, and, and we've got a good number of Eldritch in there, but, People are going to burn through that content quickly. And so it was important to us of, okay, instead of us constantly pumping out um, new content for this, let's let's put it in the hands of, of players and put it in the hands of mm -hmm. GMs because they're going to be the ones that extend you know, the, the lifespan of this game at their table. I think a lot of people see this game because it is a pretty light game and, and can be completed in as little as 45 minutes. Um, and and I, some scenarios can take up to two hours, but you're probably not going to go beyond that. I think they see that and they see like, okay, this is kind of a, this is a one-off game. I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to run through it. That'll be that. Close the cover. I'll probably be done with it until I decide I need to run another one. But this game has like a, a certain level of, of replay value and replayability that just none of our other games have because it's really easy for a GM to get in there and make their own scenario. With all of our previous games and with most TTRPGs, it's a whole undertaking for the GM to set up something interesting for the players. Yeah. We wanted to eliminate that as much as possible, and we give a basically a step-by-step -step process to do that in the book. I know, I know that some people romanticize the idea of doing zero prep games, but I'd be I'd be curious to see the actual numbers about the when it comes to people who do games zero prep and actually are zero prep. Um. Oh. Because, because I, the just the just the circumstantial evidence makes me question how, how much how much people actually do z zero prep games. Uh, I mean, there, that's not to say there isn't there that isn't the case. I mean, beer and pretzels games are a thing, but there is so, there is something to be said for the for the pick up and play model. Now that being there is now. Moving, moving in, moving in from from that. The when it comes to the die system, um, it's it 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 seems to be very much a it's very much a roll. I guess I I guess I would say this is a roll and roll under because if it's fives and sixes, nothing ha nothing happens. Um, but the. I guess the I guess the main thing the main thing is the fact that for for all intents and purposes the that that particular die that particular die pool um is what is one where think things can escalate very quickly especially given the size of dice pools from what I saw. Um, uh, and, yeah, uh, th they can. In fact, the game's kind of uh, built around. Mm -hmm excuse me, uh, is built around uh, quick escalation. And in, in fact, it, it's, that is sort of an inherent in the premise of the game and even the premise of the combat of, um, you know, I, I've i died in a turn, one turn. That was it. Um, in fact, that's not a unique experience. That's probably going to be <laughs> most people's first experience in their first combat with an Eldritch is just immediate death in fact it's it's kind of baked into the setting even um if you if you read the rule book it says that the first time you play the game as your character the hunter you've already died uh, in fact the moment you step foot into the hunter's role 
Uh, you've only done so because the bellwether, narratively speaking, has brought you back from death. So, like, immediately, right out of the gate, there's escalation. You know, like, escalation is, is in, the, is in the, the core of this game's being. And I like that because there are, there are big stakes uh, for the player, not just because they can get killed so quickly, because again, death is not necessarily a bad thing in this game. It's it's needed, um, and it's not disheartening. You know, death does death is not discouraging in this game. You get a lot from death. It's not punitive. It's rather rewarding. Um, but still, death is death, right? And so the stakes are high because Eldritch can kill you in a in one hit, um, and. Even at your strongest, the Eldritch can still kill you in just a handful of hits. So the stakes are never not there. But the stakes are there to kill the Eldritch yourself. Um, because at some point, once you have died enough and you've gotten strong enough, you can obliterate that thing. You got to have the fortitude to get there. And you got to learn something along the way. Uh, because without learning, that Eldritch is attack patterns, if you will, mm -hmm. you're not going to get to the part where you vanquish them. Yeah. But yeah, so, yeah, it's it escalates quickly. And that brings me to another uh, another th another thing that I'm curious if this is going to be in that advice section in the in the book. And that's providing providing some guidance regarding hints since that's such a crucial part of the of the gameplay loop. Yeah, so we have examples in the um, kind of create create a scenario section that will give folks not the exact way to to build out a hints list, but we will give folks enough examples of hints that hopefully, you know, it gets the the synapses firing a little bit uh, to where you you don't have to think too hard to figure out like oh okay so th okay those are the hints I think I can come up with one on my own, and so the that create a scenario section really is it holds. GM's hands, and that's uh, an intentional uh, design decision, uh, because the hints are integral to the whole uh, part of yeah. the experience. Because without them, without the hints, the the hunter, the player, would never really know how to maneuver that eldritch. So they they are necessary, and it'll be the GM via the bellwether who provides those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is something I'm big on, and that that is providing guidance for what can be considered blank check. Um, instances in design. In fact, I call it blank check design. Um, one, because you can partially blame fate for for me focusing so much on that because fate has a bit has a bit of an issue with line with going into what is a good or bad example for some of its aspects. And just saying, use your imagination is not really sufficient. It's not sufficient for most people, and it's certainly not sufficient um, in terms of how I play. So I tend to um, translate and publish games that can act as a GM's first RPG. I mean, we push that heavy with Fledgewitch. It's like, hey, if you've never GM'd a game before, this is the game to start with. But Eldritch is the same way because of the step-by-step -step tutorial that the book gives folks. Well, every game is someone's first, even if some people don't want to admit that. It's true. Uh, I know. I know. I'm rip. I know. I'm ripping off when Stanley said that, that every comic is someone's first, but the th the theory still applies. Uh, and now, with the, with that in with that in mind, the one of the one of the um, narrative aspects that I found kind of interesting is that you you have the fact that there are these monsters all throughout. To, all throughout Tokyo, but everyone more or less treats it as as if th as if things are normal, even if nobody's seen the sun in God knows how long. Yeah, it's it is a it's a cool setting. So uh, I I'll be completely honest with you. Mm -hmm. When I'm looking at games and I'm scouting games, or in this case, when I'm helping fund its development and have some say in it, yes, I'm looking at mechanics, and that stuff's really important, especially now more than ever since our stuff is going to be in bookstores we have to have very accessible games primarily because our stuff 
our stuff is being shelved in the manga and light novel section. So non-RPG players are going to be trying to play our books. So our stuff has to be accessible. And so mechanics more than ever are really important to me. For me personally, though, I can find a game with awesome mechanics in a garbage setting and I don't have any interest in it. However, I could find a game with a great setting and not great mechanics, and I'm interested. <laughs> um, and fortunately, I think all of our games so far have had a great setting and great mechanics. Eldritch is no different. I think, and I'm not just saying this because it's the game I'm promoting right now, um, I think it's my favorite setting that we've done just because it speaks to me the most because I like, I like a modern day setting um that has a lot of fantastical elements to this so you know i've built this as a grim fantasy modern day rpg um and that's what it is because yes you are in tokyo but because you've been brought back to life at the start of the game after having been killed by an eldritch and you are given a bellwether as your guide you can see things that no one else in tokyo sees so the average uh denizen of tokyo is just walking along you know going about their day oblivious to all the changes that have happened in Tokyo. For one, the sun has, has, um, has stopped rising in Tokyo. So the sun hasn't come up in a while, but no one seems to notice. Um, there are two moons in the sky. No one seems to notice people are, you know, crossing a busy sidewalk and are getting snatched up and eaten violently by a massive monster and no one even stops and and or runs or screams everyone just acts like it didn't happen the player the hunter however because of the bellwether they see all of this in fact they're the only ones who see all of this which means they are the only ones who can kill an Eldritch. So there's a lot um, riding on the hunters. Uh, in, in fact, we, we call this ability uh, for the hunter to be able to see Tokyo for what it actually is and for what's actually happening. We, we, we call it insight. We go into this whole thing about a hunter's insight. Mm -hmm. um, but there was something just very uh, inherently appealing to me, as I was reading the lore, about that kind of premise, just because it's so surreal, it's eerie, it's creepy, um, it's fucking weird, right? Like, people are getting eaten and, and no one is, like, stopping and, like, no one is seeing this? That's cool to me. I like that. Uh, you don't see that a whole lot in, you know, in the the world building of, of, of anything. I mean, RPGs and anything. So, I love the setting. Mm-hmm. And with that, with all that in mind, what would you be shooting for as far as the total page count for the book? So we are at a very similar page count, excuse me, as Fledge Witch, which is me, which means we're a hundred plus. Um, we're going to be a little bit longer than Fledge Witch, just because this, the, the scenarios in this game are are um, a lot longer than the scenarios in Fledge Witch. Uh, where we where we end up north of a hundred. That hasn't been determined just yet because we're still adding things to the book and we're still formatting the book. Um, and because we're now working with this new size uh, per the request of our distributor of, of an A5 size book instead of a, a B5 size, which were the size of our first two games, um, it has required us to um, approach layouts very differently, which means when you're making a smaller book, obviously you're going to have uh, a higher page count. And that... So that'll be true for Eldritch Escape as well. We'll be somewhere north of 100. And we've priced it accordingly. Um, at least I think, we've, I think we've priced it accordingly. But what's in, what's in these pages is kind of different from like a Fledge Witch, which will have a similar length, but because, of, because there's sort of baked-in replayability in Eldritch and because of the type of uh, you know, role-playing game that it is... Um, those hundred pages, hundred plus pages are, are I think going to be packed full of the ability, not just to read what's in them, but to, to then take what's in them and, and make your own world. So if I had to guess, we'll probably end up at a hundred and probably 130, hmm. but that could change. Put me on it. Hmm. 
might come in at 120, might come in at 140. I think for Convictor Drive, uh, not in this interview, but another interview, I was like, yeah, we'll probably end up around uh, 125 pages. And then we ended up with like 155. So uh, I've got I've got a kind of a large margin of error there. Oh yeah, and I will certainly be looking forward to to seeing how things shake out with it. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way back to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Mildred, I love these conversations. Um, I really appreciate you you reaching out with all of these projects. Uh, you are the most consistent person to reach out to us, and we're we're in a very niche business. Mm -hmm. And so, I probably am more appreciative than maybe the average person, just because I know that not a lot of people are willing to cover our stuff because Japanese role playing games aren't a huge thing just yet, but you always are. Um, and so I don't forget that, which is why I think every time you reach out, I'm like, yep, let's do it. <laughs> um, uh, even if I'm like, Oh gosh, where am I going to fit that in? It's like, well, I'm going to fit it in somewhere because Mildred is, he always comes back. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you. Um, just remember a wall, a wall is just a door with a different kind of key. Well said. But, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!